1999, Global March to Israel. Now here are Dr. and Mrs. Jack Vanapay. Hello friends. We are delighted to have this opportunity to present to you a documentary on the wonderful nation of Israel. I've never seen anything done on it in completed form. The past, the present, and the future of Israel, and we're going to attempt to do that for you right now. And Jack, you have spent a tremendous amount of time of research on this project. I started 12 months ago. I read every book available on the subject. I studied Encyclopedia Britannica, Encyclopedia Judaica plus scores of magazines. I literally had hundreds of articles, and we're going to feature many of them, Rexella, today as we unfold the story from Israel's inception to its conclusion. You know, Jack, I'd like to begin the tape right now with a wonderful quote. Perhaps you've heard it, and it stuck in my heart, and uh, it certainly was a blessing to me. Queen Victoria asked her Jewish Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, can you give me one verse in the Bible that will prove it's true? Listen to what he said. Your Majesty, I will give you one word, Jew. Certainly, it is an important word, Jack. The Jewish nation of Israel is so important all through the Bible. It really is, Rexel, and to let our viewers get a grasp of the importance of Israel, I want to present this introduction. World conditions especially the tense Middle East situation, have aroused interest in Bible prophecy to an all-time high. But it's impossible to grasp God's prophetic plan apart from an understanding of His promises to Israel. All prophetic truth revolves around the Jews. The Bible reviews their history and unfolds their future. The future of the world will be affected by the future of Israel. In this work, will give special attention to the dispersion and sufferings of the Jewish people, believing this will lead to a better understanding between Jews and Gentiles, and that it will help viewers to appreciate the Jewish longing for a national home. The history of the Jews during the past 2,000 years is a panorama of persecution. It is doubtful that any people have suffered so consistently and so long as have the descendants of Abraham Isaac and Jacob. Anti-Semitism is a cancer that never seems to heal. Although there have been periods of respite, this evil has erupted periodically, bringing misery and heartache to the children of Israel. Are we about to witness another wave of persecution of Jews? Old Testament prophets were careful to outline the events of the end time as they would affect Israel and the world. They saw a return of the Jews to their homeland in the latter days. Does the existence of the state of Israel fulfill that Bible prophecy? Today, most Christians are acquainted with the terms in the prophecy vocabulary, such as the rapture of the church, the tribulation period, the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, Armageddon, and the millennium. What do these terms mean? And when will the events of which they speak find fulfillment? We present this study as an aid in understanding Bible prophecy as it relates to Israel and the world. This video will reveal that the only lasting source of peace after Israel's final holocaust is the Messiah. Yeah, Jack, I was just sitting here thinking, what in the world would happen to the would have happened to the world if the Jews had never been? Why we would have missed so many scientists and great politicians and and chemists and so forth, like Albert Einstein and so forth. Time Wiseman, the World War One chemist, Rubinstein, Paderewski, Bernard Baruch great comedians, and you know why so many comedians have come out of the Jewish community? Because they suffered so horrendously down through the centuries, as we're going to see, that they used humor among themselves to alleviate some of the pain. Mm. But, Rexella, this is something. Though the Jews constitute only one half of one percent of the world population, they have received 12 percent of the Nobel Prizes. In other words, if they were 1% of the population, they would have 25% of the Nobel Peace Prizes. And if you 
carry that out to 4%, they would have it all. God, why, why, Great geniuses. Why do you think, Jack, God gifted them so much? Because in Genesis 17, God promised he would bless them in abundance. Mm. All right, where does God first mention the nation of Israel or the Jewish people, Jack, in the Bible? I'm going to go slowly on this because it's really interesting. In Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, we find these words, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. Now, I used to travel for a while with a great black preacher, B.M. Nottage. He was an early man at the time who held Shem, Ham, Japheth rallies to promote unity among the races. And so I first learned this from his lips. And he said, the father of the Jews is Sham, the father of the black people is Ham, and the father of the Gentiles is Japheth. When one studies this 10th chapter of Genesis, beginning with verses 21 to 31, he discovers 26 different sons who came forth from the loins of Noah and then Shem. When we get to the 11th chapter, beginning with verses 10 to 31, we find the genealogical table from Shem to, watch it, Abram. And I think you recognize that name as being the father of Israel and the father of Ishmael, the Arabs. When we get to chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, we have God's call to Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and promises to bless him in verse 3, saying, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. But watch it when we get to the 14th chapter of Genesis, verse 13. His name is Abram the Hebrew. There's the beginning. Shem, Abram, the Hebrew. And then in Genesis 17, 5, we go on to discover that his name is changed from Abram, A-B-R-A-M, to Abraham. Why? Abram means the exalted father that he was. But when God changed his name to Abraham, it meant the father of many nations, not only Israel, but the Arab nations of the world as well. You see, Sarah was 90 years of age, Abraham 99, and God promised him, special seed. Sarah even laughed. Her name means laughter. But God fulfilled his promise and gave them Isaac. First, he tried to fulfill the prophecies that he'd be the father of many nations by having an affair with Hagar, the handmaiden of Sarah, and bore Ishmael. And even in Genesis 17, 17 and 18, he's arguing with Yahweh God that Ishmael should be the one that has all the blessings heaped upon him, but God refuses. He says, no, it'll be through Isaac, all right? Thus far, we have Shem as the progenitor or forefather of Abram, called Abram the Hebrew. And then, of course, his name was changed to Abraham. He bore Isaac. Isaac bore Jacob. And in Genesis 32, 28, Yahweh God speaking to him, Jacob says, Thy name shall no more be called Jacob but Israel. And then, of course, over in 2 Kings 17.34, we find again that Jacob is Israel. Now, where does the term Jew fit into the picture? It comes from the tribe of Judah. Today, however, when we speak of one who's a citizen of Israel, he's an Israelite. Jew has to do with his religion. However, since there's so much confusion on the matter, we won't be technical throughout the program, and so there'll be times we use the terms interchangeably. Beautifully said, Jack. Wonderful. It would take hours to cover all of the history of the Jews, so perhaps the best way is to cover the covenants. And uh, this will extend from Abraham to Christ. Now, there were basically five during that period of time. The first one is the Abrahamic covenant. And that's found in Genesis chapters 12, verses 1 to 3, chapter 13, verses 14 to 18, chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, and chapter 17, verses 1 to 22. And we'll be giving you these texts so that you can look them up as you 
study the tape more thoroughly. And Jack, this was the foundation of all the succeeding covenants to Israel in which God promises unconditionally to raise up a seed unto Abraham and to give him and his seed an everlasting possession. The second covenant was the Mosaic covenant, and this covenant with Israel was conditioned upon their obedience to God's commands. And that's found in Exodus chapter 19, verses 14 to 18, and it's based on the Ten Commandments of the next chapter, 20, verses 3 to 17. Thou shalt have no gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness, lie. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, possessions, etc. And then God said in Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 to 28 to Israel, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments. As you know, Israel, as well as Gentiles, failed in keeping those commandments. So later, we'll discuss the new covenant, but let's get back to right, the... Then the third, third one, one is the Palestinian covenant, Jack, and it was unconditional covenant enlarging upon the Abrahamic covenant, mm -hmm. promising the seed of Abraham eternal possession in the land. And that's Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 to 10 and this expands as Rick Sella said on the Abrahamic covenant which promises the land to Israel. Not Ishmael through Hagar but Israel through Isaac. Right then the fourth the Davidic covenant an unconditional covenant with God and David reaffirming the Abrahamic covenant and adding that the blessings would be attached to the lineage of David. And one can find that study in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 1 to 16 and 2 Samuel chapter 23 verses 1 to 22. You referred to the new covenant a moment ago, and this is the new covenant, an unconditional covenant God made with Israel to replace the Mosaic covenant, which the people had failed to obey. They failed to obey the Ten Commandments. That's Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 40, and it can also be found in the New Testament because it's not only for Jews, but will be for believers, Christians as well. Uh, as the book of Hebrews mentions a number of times. Jack, we need to understand part of the past of the Jews in order to understand the future of the Jews. So let's start with the diaspora, which is the way the Jewish people um, say the dispersion, where they were driven uh, out of their land. The dispersion was not new to the Jews. Captivity had been God's method of correcting them in the past. The Assyrians had taken the northern kingdom captive in about 722 B.C. Some years later, in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and took the remainder of the people to Babylon. Before his death, Moses had warned his people that diaspora, captivity, and persecution would come to them if they did not obey the laws of God. Let's go on. During the period between the resurrection of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem, they were the hunted. Imprisonment, slavery, and death became their lot. Those who remember about the Nazi nightmare, they will remember six million Jews who died in Europe. They might conclude that Hitler's hatred of this people was a phenomenon of the 20th century, but not so. For Jewish blood had been spilled across Europe and in other parts of the world for centuries. In taking the long look at history, friends, one sees that the Jews had been steadily marching toward Hitler's ovens ever since the fall of their beloved city in 70 A.D., so I'd like to ask Jack to do something for us. Give us a picture of what has happened since 70 A.D. Well, first of all, God told them if they wouldn't obey the commandments, there would be problems. They would suffer. And he said in Deuteronomy 28, verse 37, you will become a proverb, a byword. And then in verse 41, he says, Thou shalt bear sons and daughters. The 
but you shall not enjoy them. Then in verse 67, he says, in the morning you'll say, would to God it were night. And at night you'll say, would to God it were morning. Because of the barrage of persecutions and holocausts that fell on these people. And I think your heart's going to be opened right now with compassion. As you hear what these precious people have suffered for the centuries, you see, the devil hates the Jew. It's the Jew who gave us every book of the Bible but one. Luke, and then Acts, of course, because he also wrote the book of Acts. In Romans chapter 9, Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not my conscience also, bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren who are Israelites. And then he says, who have received the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came. God gave them every blessing. He allowed them to have these covenants, allowed them to write the commandments and use a Jewish virgin Mary to bring his son into the world. So the devil hates this race because Yahweh God loved them. Deuteronomy 7, 8. So he's done everything to exterminate them. Watch this for a moment. In A.D. 70, Titus, the Roman general, marched down to Jerusalem and slaughtered one million of God's chosen people. Now, I won't be saying A.D. all the time because that would become monotonous. So let's move on, knowing that it's in the A.D. realm of history. In 135, Vespasian murdered 135,000 as this Roman general marched against them. In 312, another Roman leader came against Israel and murdered 500,000 Jews. Theodosius did so in 438. In 1020, Canute of England drove every Jew out of the land of England. They returned. So in 1272, King Edward I said, we must rid our nation again of the Jew. And by 1290, they had in 1306, French farmers with pitchforks marched upon the Jews, stabbing them and driving them out of the land. 1348, they were driven out of the Rhineland, Germany. 1350, out of Prague, Czechoslovakia. 1492, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain ordered every Jew out of the nation and put 800,000 of them into little boats, sending them out to sea where Every one of them drowned. This is one of the reasons Christopher Columbus may have come to the new land to seek a place of refuge for Jews. In 1495, they were driven out of Lithuania. 1497, out of Portugal. There was no rest for these people. Let's move ahead. 1880 to the year 1900, Every single Jew was ordered out of Russia, and they all fled to England and the USA. That's why 75% of all Jews in England and America are of Russian background. Then, of course, history marched on. It was 1933. Adolf Gruber, Hitler, came to power, murdered six million of these precious people in his concentration camps and gas chambers. But what we forget is that... Joseph Stalin murdered more than six million of these Jews, but we seldom mention this maniac. Oh, I'd hate to be in the shoes of these two men right now as they burn in the fires of hell, and rightfully so. But here's a little interesting background, Rexella. We find that these persecuted Jews had a longing for a place where they could set their foot, where they wouldn't be slaughtered, killed, massacred, a wholesale way. And it was 1895 when Theodor Herzl, an Austrian Jewish newspaper man, went to Paris, France to cover the trial of Alfred Dreyfus, a military genius in the French army who was accused of passing secrets to the Germans. When Herzl came to Paris, his heart was crushed. For he saw the mobs storming the prison crying, kill the Jew, kill the Jew. He never forgot it. 
He went home to Austria and wrote a book called Der Jodenstadt, The Jewish State. Two years later, he called for a Zionist conference, 1897, in Switzerland. They came from all over. It was well attended. And when it was concluded, he said, I have laid the foundation for our own homeland. Fifty years later, May 14, 1948, it came into existence. And they called that new homeland Israel. There was another young man at the time who was studying the writings of Herzl named David Hron or Green. And he, as a newspaper man, went to Israel, stayed, became the editor of the Zionist paper, and changed his name to David Ben-Gurion. Recognize it? But God was with the Jewish people. For the Ottoman Empire, the Turks had controlled Palestine for 400 years. Then in 1917, a miracle happened. General Allenby decided to march against the Turks. And the airplane had just been discovered, and he sent two of his British pilots over the heads of the Turks. They had never seen men flying as birds, Isaiah 31, 5. And because Allenby dropped pamphlets by the thousands across the land, and his name, Allenby, means Allah be God's son. They thought it was a message from heaven and they literally surrendered without firing a shot. That created a hunger for the Jew now to go to his land because the Turks were no longer in charge and the British had a warm spot in their heart because Kaim Wiseman invented some of the weapons the British used to win World War I along with the USA. And then Adolf Hitler came to power, murdered six million of these people. And now this was the beginning of the longing in their heart for their land. So they've really suffered. And the land they now have, they call Israel. They deserve. Mm, Jack, tremendous. Mm. Let's talk just a little bit more about this horrible man called Adolf Hitler. I'd like for you to see on the screen right now a picture of him. And this picture shows him in front of the Eiffel Tower after Germany had conquered France. The next is the cover of U.S. News and World Report. And of course, these are the men who opposed him, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Churchill of England. I'd like for you to see probably one of the most important headlines of history, the Detroit News, Hitler is dead. And, of course, this meant that uh, the war was over. Can you imagine how the Jewish people felt that day when they saw the headline? Mm -hmm. I would like to read for you just a, a little bit about a report that I have from World War II and the Holocaust. I think much about it as I read for you right now. This madman, Adolf Hitler, saw the Jew as worse than a demon. They were a disease. A demon can be exercised, but a disease must be purged. Hitler pronounced the need to purge the less fit, meaning Jews, and the black people. The Nazi gang and their strategy was this. They plotted with him, and uh, some of the other mitzvits were called Hermann Goering, Rudolf Hess, Heinrich Himmler, and Joseph Goebbels. Horrible, horrible men, just like Adolf Hitler. Hitler's demonic program of genocide was first fueled by Goebbels' pen in an incessant barrage of anti-Semitic propaganda. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about how we're seeing some of that resurge right now. In his 12-year rampage as Fuhrer, five progressive stages of that surgery may be observed. The first stage began immediately when he took office and was designed to destroy all Jewish businesses in Germany. The second stage came in 1935 when the Nuremberg Laws were passed, depriving all Jews of citizenship. The third stage began with a mass arrest of Jews in September 1939 at the outbreak of war. The fourth stage came in 1940 when all Jews were incarcerated and in concentration camps. And the fifth and final stage of this madness was called the Final Solution and was initiated by Nazi leadership in 1942. 
the purpose of the concentration camps changed from detention to extermination, and murder became a full-time German occupation. Now, the German people were not responsible, but Adolf Hitler was responsible with the men that I just named, and some of the other people were encouraging him to do this, mm. Jack. It's amazing how even the Christians of Germany were duped through this politician. We have to beware. Today, we have many anti-Semitic voices internationally, but also in the United States of America. And I want you to see something on the screen. It states, was there really a Holocaust? And we have a group of alleged Christians found in the Aryan churches of America and in some of the others who hate the Jews, do everything imaginable to fight them. And this is one of their pamphlets saying that the Holocaust was a hoax, that six million Jews did not die. So again, I want you to see something on the screen that's literally shocking. This is the documentary of all the nations where the Jews lived. This is the list of Jews who died, the countries from which they came, and notice the total at the bottom. And these Jews were registered in all the nations before they were driven out of their nations by Hitler and killed. It came to almost six million. There's one other thing I want you to see on the screen right now. It's entitled, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. This is the biggest piece of trash, the biggest piece of garbage that's ever been put into print. And it's so anti-Semitic, so vitriolic against the Jews that it's unbelievable. Now, this piece of literature was printed in 1902 by Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, along with Sergei Nihilus, a Russian Orthodox priest. They fabricated all of the things in this booklet. None of it was right. But the world took it because of its anti-Semitic stance. In 1921, a name you'll all know, Henry Ford, who hated Jews, and I'm told Indians as well, had all these articles from the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion reprinted in the Dearborn Independent Paper. Even though the London Times in that same year said they were all fabrications and none of it was true. Nevertheless, he disseminated this throughout America and it eventually spread throughout the whole world. Then we find that Adolf Hitler in his book Mein Kampf took the same writings to infuriate his people against these Jews. And on and on it went until in the 60s, Nasser of Egypt, and in the 70s, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia reprinted all of this trash just to create this hatred mm. against the Jew. If you ever see that book or these pamphlets deriding the Jews and the Holocaust, get rid of it. It isn't worth it. And let me say to you, name the name of Christ, and you have this anti-Semitism, and you print this literature, and you call yourselves Christians, your religion isn't worth mentioning. It's an abomination, a stench in the nostrils of God. Christianity is love for all men. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, because you have love one for another, John 13, 35. He that saith he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness, 1 John 2, 9. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever practiseth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Plain Rex Ellick? He that loveth not knoweth not God. If a man say, I love God and he hates his brother, he's a liar. First John 4, 20. The Holy Spirit said that. That's real Christianity. Love for others. You need to love the whole human race. And I say that because many of our precious Jewish friends say, we have no respect for Christianity because the Christians yes. are the ones who've hated us. Mm -hmm. Well, the Christians by name. 
not Christians by heart. Let me just insert one little thing here, Jack. You know, I have a very good Jewish friend, and she does alterations for me. And I was witnessing to her, and she said, you know, Rexall, I find it very hard. You know, I was in one of Hitler's concentration camps, and she showed me the mark on her, her arm, and she said, he was a Christian, too. I was amazed. Some of the Jews think that Hitler was a Christian. Yeah, he was baptized in the church. So yeah. was Joseph Stalin. He studied for the priesthood. Between these two men, something like 12 million Jews died. Mm -hmm. Well, I had the wonderful privilege of yeah. showing her he wasn't a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> We've just talked about the diaspora and the dispersion of the Jews around the world. And, uh, but... I'm so happy to say that the Word of God announced that the diaspora guarantees their return to the land God promised them in Jeremiah 31, 10, and 11. And in fact, Bible scholars for the past 300 years predicted that the Jews would return to their own land in the latter days. A man by the name of Increase Mather, who was the president of Harvard College, wrote in 1669 the first of many volumes on prophecy entitled The Mystery of Israel's Salvation. He wrote that there was no doubt the Jews would return to the land of their fathers. Dr. Winchester wrote in 1800 that the return of the Jews to their own land is certain. And in 1852, a Reverend Bickersteth wrote a book entitled The Restoration of the Jews to Their Own Land. In 18, or rather 1918, Dr. David Barron wrote in great detail about the coming return of the Jews to their land. Let's see what's happened. In 1900, there were 50,000 uh, Jews in Palestine. In 1922, there were 84,000. In 1931, there were 175,000. In 1948, there were 650,000. Of course, this is when they became Israel. And in 1952, there were 1,421,000. And today, there are approximately 3.5 million Jews in Israel. Thus, the number of Jews has increased over 120 times in the last 100 years. That's quite some statistic. And it never happened for 25 centuries, 2,500 years. So what has occurred is not just happenstance. It's the fulfillment of the Word of God like these scholars of the last 300 years predicted what happened because they stood upon the foundation of this book. Now where are these prophecies found? Ezekiel 36, 24, Yahweh God says, I will gather you from among the Gentiles, gather you out of all nations, and put you, place you into your own land. In Ezekiel chapter 37, we have the vision of the valley of the dry bones. Remember the spiritual? Them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. The ankle won't connect to the head bone. <laughs> Stick to speaking, honey. <laughs> Be patient, I'll soon have that on a go label record. What does it mean? The prophet sees these bones arising out of graveyards, flesh and sinew forming on them, and the bones arising in a lively state and walking around. He tells us this is not symbolical, mythological language, for verse 11 says in that 37th chapter, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Now, there was no Israel for 2,500 years, but God says that these Jews scattered to all the Gentile nations of the world would arise, be resurrected, come back to life, and return to their own land. And they have. And they're there to stay. The prophet Amos says in chapter 9, verse 15, I will plant them in their own land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord God, Yahweh. Well, not only did the Bible teach that the Jewish people would be restored, but that they actually would become a nation. Listen to this. I think it's going to bless your heart. The time was 4 p.m. The date was Friday, May 14, 1948. A black sedan pulled up to the front of the Tel Aviv Museum. Out of the back seat emerged a short, white-haired man with his wife. A policeman posted on the pavement saluted. The old man drew himself up stiffly and returned the salute proudly. He then climbed to the steps hurriedly to the museum's entrance. 
He had been born in 1886 as David Gruen or Green in Russia. As David Ben Gruen, his adopted Hebrew name, he met that day with other members of the Jewish agency to issue a proclamation that men throughout the world thought never would be made. It stated, Today a Jewish nation is born and its name is Israel. A very good question, I think, right at this point that we could ask Jack. Was this the beginning of the end of the age, do you think, Jack? It really was. And I'm proud of America because Harry Truman was the first to congratulate the new nation called Israel. This was the beginning of the end. Yes. Why? Listen to Jesus, Matthew 24, verses 32 through 34. He said, Learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, all the signs of Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapters 17 and 21, all these things happening simultaneously with the fig tree coming to life, Israel becoming a nation, then know that my coming is near. How near? Even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation. And some have figured that to mean that the Jewish race would never be obliterated because Genea can mean race, but that's not what he's saying here. The, this generation, the one that lives to see the fig tree coming to life, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, oftentimes you've heard the expression that Israel is the fig tree, but it's never been proven to you, so let me do so. There is what is called the law of first mention of the Bible. When anything is mentioned the first time, it becomes that throughout God's holy word. All right, Joel 1.7, an enemy is invading Israel of old, and God says they have stripped or barked my fig tree, Israel. Then in Hosea 9.10, God says to the Israelites of old, I saw your fathers, your forefathers, as the first ripened in my fig tree. No doubt about it. Jesus said, when the fig tree comes to life, and it did, May 14th, 1948, then the generation living to see it shall not pass. How long is a generation? 51.4 years. I used to think it was 40 years because of Psalm 95, verse 10, but watch this. In Genesis 12, 4, we have the age of Abraham. There he is again recorded. He was 75 at that point in time. So we can know exactly how old or how many years passed from the birth of Abraham to the birth of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because in Matthew 1.17 it says, So all the generations from Abraham unto David are 14 generations. And all the generations from David unto the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And all the generations from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Three times 14 equals 42 generations. How many years passed? Thelia, the great chronologist, says from the birth of Abraham to the birth of Christ, 2,160 years transpired. Thus one divides 42 generations into 2,160, and his final number is 51.4 years. They became a nation May 14th, and that's into the fifth month of that year. 1948, add 51.4 years. We come out to September, October, 1999. We're not date setters. For Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, But the day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, but adds, wait a minute, don't say you can't know when it's near. Back up to verse 33, you'll know when it's near, even at the door. When Israel became a nation, that was the beginning of the end because not one sign was meaningful until that point in time for Jesus said, I remind you in verse 33, when you should see all these things, all these signs of the Gospels happening simultaneously with Israel becoming a nation. That's it. So from 48 onward, we've been on the move. And he's coming. Jack, you know, the end time was pinpointed just a little bit more when the Jews took Jerusalem. And uh, this is quite astounding to me. Since 400 B.C., the city of Jerusalem passed from one Gentile power to another.
In AD 70, the Romans had it. In 614, the Persians. In 637, Caliph uh, Omar took possession of it. 1099, the Crusaders. And then there was 1187, Saladin took it. In 1250, uh, the Egyptian Mamelukes took possession of it. In 1517, the Turks. In 1917, the British. And finally, in 1967, the Jews. From one hand to the other. In bringing about the birth of their nation, the Jews had to pay a terrible, terrible price. And that price was their own blood. Through the War of Independence, 1956, the Six-Day War, which was 1967, and Yom Kippur, the war that happened then in 1973. A terrible, terrible time. And now, Jack, explain to us, if you will, the importance of the Jew taking Jerusalem. And do you think it's going to stay in their hands? Oh, Rex, now this is so exciting. I mean, first of all, Israel was not a nation for 25 centuries, but... She gained statehood in 1948 in our era of time. But what really pinpoints it is the Jews taking Jerusalem in 1967. Why? Because in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem. From that point onward, Rexel read all the differing nations that controlled it, the Jews were never in possession of their land or their holy city, Jerusalem, until 1967. A total of 2,553 years. It's not just one of those things. This is exciting. Why? Listen to Jesus again in Luke 21, verses 24 to 28. He said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which shall come to pass on the earth. Then skipping over to verse 28, he says, when you shall see all these things happening, space signs in connection with the Jews controlling Jerusalem, then what? Lift up your heads. Look up. Your redemption draws nigh. What redemption? Of the soul? The spirit? No. The redemption of the body. Romans 8.23. The rapture when Christ calls his church home. For he says, back there in verse 27, Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of glory. Excellent. This is really exciting to have this all happening in our particular area of time. Now, you asked me a question. Yes. Will the Gentiles get Jerusalem back? Yes. First of all, Russia is going to make the attempt in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, as we'll see later on the video. That will fail. Then they gather together in a place called Armageddon. Now, Armageddon is not the war. That's only a gathering place. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon, Har Megiddo, literally, Revelation 16, 16. They gather there. They then march over to the valley of Jehoshaphat, Joel 3, verse 2, right under the Mount of Olives at Jerusalem. And at that point, Zechariah the prophet says in chapter 14, verse 2, that God gathers all all nations to Jerusalem to battle. Why? Because that's when his son, the Messiah, is going to return and put down the armies of the world. But for a brief period of time, a day, maybe a week, it says they shall take the city. But no, it's going to remain in Jewish hands until that time. Then the Gentiles will take it for a brief day, week. Messiah comes. He comes with his armies, Revelation 19, 14. He's victorious as King of kings and Lord of lords. And then from that moment on, Jerusalem is the eternal, I repeat, eternal capital of Israel. Hmm. Quite an important city. 
We've considered the events of the past. Now let's move on into the future. This next article is absolutely stirring and astounding to me. A book written in the 1930s and recently rediscovered created a stir with its startling 20th century predictions. The book entitled Reckonings of Redemption was written by the late Rabbi Haim Shively. In it, the rabbi stated, Everything Jews need to know about their future is recorded in the book of Daniel. In it, he forecast a great war that would include the use of chemical and germ warfare. He predicted it would be waged among Arabs during the Jewish feast of Sukkot in the year, the Jewish year, 5751 or 1991, followed by the Messianic era. Now, can you imagine that? He said, everything the Jews need to know about their future is written in the book of Daniel. Do you agree with that, Jack? Absolutely. Rexella, I'm so excited about the book of Daniel that I want to do an entire study, maybe even verse by verse, in the future. A f about a year ago, I saw that everything concerning the future is found in the 12 chapters of the book of Daniel. I thought it was the only one who had ever seen it. And then I found this book by Rabbi Shively, Reckonings of Redemption. And he said what you just stated, that everything the Jew needs to know about his future is in that book. Let me prove that. In Daniel, the 10th chapter, there's a battle going on as the prophet tries to get his prayers through to his God. And the prayers are hindered for 21 days by the prince of the power of the air, Satan, Ephesians 2, 2. Finally, Michael the archangel breaks through, appears to the prophet, tells him what happened, and then says in verse 14 of Daniel 10, I'm come to show thee what shall befall thy people, the Jews. When? In the latter days. Chapter 12, verse 4 defines latter days as the time of the end. Now, what did the rabbi say? What have I felt? Let's go through the book of Daniel very quickly. This is going to be a deep, rich study for a couple of minutes. In chapter 2, we have Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And he had this dream where he saw this great image, but forgot what his dream was. He called together his magicians, astrologers, soothsayers, said, I had a dream and I can't remember it. Tell me what it was or I'll have you put to death. Oh, they couldn't do it. He killed many of them. Someone said, there is a prophet whose God is Yahweh. He prays three times a day. Let's call him. Daniel came before the great king and said, I am not a great genius, but I have a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Daniel 2.28. Daniel went to prayer. God showed him what it was. He went before Nebuchadnezzar and he said, you saw this image. It had a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, stomach and thighs of brass, two legs of iron, and ten toes of iron mixed with clay. You're a genius. No, I've got a great God. But let me tell you an interpretation. The head of gold is you, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. But soon, the chest and arms of silver will destroy you. And it happened. And Cyrus and then Darius marched upon Babylon and took it. Then he said, in history will come the stomach and thighs of brass, Greece under Alexander the Great, who will crush the Medes and Persians. It happened. Then he said, there will be two legs of iron that will smash Alexander's empire. And the two legs of iron will represent Rome. Then right at the end time will be ten toes, iron mixed with clay. Hmm. Revived Rome. If you want to really study this, get my video, two hours in length, on the E.C. Antichrist, because I believe that Revive Rome is presently the E.C. or common market. Same nations. Wish I could get into that. All right. Chapter 3 of Daniel. We have the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Three Hebrew children. 
They are to bow to these foreign gods, but they love Yahweh, the Almighty, and they won't. So the king has them cast into a fiery furnace. And I love verses 24 and 25. For Nebuchadnezzar, the king, looks into the fiery furnace. And there's no harm. And he said, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They're not being harmed. And then he adds, lo, I see four. And the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. This was a theophany, a Christophany, as it's called in theological terms, an appearance of Christ in angelic form to protect his Hebrew children. These were Israelites. These were Jews. And it's a picture of God protecting his people, the Jews, during the tribulation hour. That's what he's going to do when you get to the 12th chapter, verse 1. There should be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And at that time, Daniel, thy people shall be spared, saved, delivered. Get it? The Jew will be going through the tribulation, as will prove a little later. The church will be gone, Revelation 4.1. But they're spared. God protects them in a divine way. In chapter 7, we have again Daniel's dream of the four beasts. A lion, a bear, a leopard, and finally a composite beast, which has the features of all the others. Again, the empires, Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greco, and Rome. Revived Roman Empire, the E.C. Now, out of this empire, in chapter 7, this Antichrist arises and has world dominion and control. He devours the whole earth, chapter 7, verse 23. All dominion shall obey and serve him, verse 27. He is the king of fear, Scott, in chapter 8, verse 23. He makes a covenant with Israel for peace. In chapter 9, verse 27, he confirms the covenant with many for one heptad, one week, seven years. And we'll talk more about that contract because God showed me something unbelievable recently. Then, of course, in chapter 10, we started with that because he said, I'm going to show you, verse 14, what shall befall thy people, the Jews, in the latter years, the time of the end. He adds, as you continue reading that, at that time, the end, Michael will return. Why? To fight the prince of Persia. Who's Persia? <laughs> the Medo-Persian Empire, the chest and arms of silver, Iran and Iraq. This thing that recently happened in Iraq is going to happen again. Read Revelation 9, verses 14 to 16. In fact, as the Orientals march across Iraq and through the Euphrates River, it's against Israel. That's exactly when Michael returns to fight. Revelation 12, verses 7 to 12. Study it when you have time. Then, of course, this Antichrist comes to power and fools the Jews because he says, I'm here in the name of peace. He enters in peaceably. Chapter 11, verse 21. He comes in peaceably, verse 24, but he honors the God of forces, verse 38. After the contract is broken in the middle of the seven years, Daniel 9, 27, we have the armies coming from the south, the north, the east, against the west, the E.C., for they are the protectorates of Israel at that point in time, Daniel 11, verses 40 to 44, and that brings us right through that 12th chapter, the time of the end. That's why we know we're living in the end times. Unbelievable book. Thank you, Rabbi Shively <laughs> yes. and the Holy Spirit for showing me these things. Yes, I tell you, that's an unbelievable book, isn't it, Jack? It is. The prophecies concerning the Jews going home to their homeland and becoming a nation and taking Jerusalem have been fulfilled. But there is uh, one additional prophecy that I'd like to talk about right now, and that's the final tribes of the Jews returning from around the world to Israel. Well, this is interesting, Rexella, because first of all, we mentioned the return of the Jews a few moments ago because some had to return in order to have a nation, in order that they might win the battle to take Jerusalem. But once they had statehood, once the fig tree had blossomed, once they had taken Jerusalem, then a second wave of Jews mm -hmm. would come right 
before <laughs> Messiah returns. Mm. And this is what we're discussing now. All right, Jack, uh, Syria is the first nation I'd like to mention about the Jews going home. The curb is lifted and the Jews from Syria began a great exodus. Israel flies Jews out of Ethiopia, and we all remember that great airlift, don't we? The airlift culminates 17 years of secret Israeli links to Ethiopian government, and this is taken out of the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. Oh, let me get at that for a moment. This is exciting. You know, when we talk about Jews, we usually think of those who have the characteristics of Groucho Marx or Milton Berle. But those are the Ashkenazi Jews from Europe. They're Oriental and black Jews. And the black Jews settled in Ethiopia and were called Falashis. Now, what happened was one of two things. The Queen of Sheba, and this can be found in 1 Kings 10:13, visited Solomon. They undoubtedly had an affair and Menelik was born, a black Jew. He stayed for a while, later went back to Ethiopia and with his mother, the Queen of Sheba. Or in Exodus 2.21, Moses was married to a black Egyptian, Zipporah, and bore children. So the genealogical line can come from either one of the two. This is exciting because Operation Moses, 1984 and 85, was so led by Yahweh God that even Muslims helped these black Jews escape. The airlift took place at Khartoum, and they flew to Belgium because, and I'm proud of this, I'm a Belgian, right. Belgium said, we will help these black Jews get back to Israel. So from Khartoum, they went to Brussels, Belgium, and then from there to Israel. And they had 6,758 Ethiopian Jews during that first lift in 1984 to 85. Later came Operation Solomon, where the remaining 14,500 went home to Israel. Now, these people hadn't even been in an automobile. They lived in the backward parts of Ethiopia, but they always knew there were Jews because they kept Shabbat, Sabbath, and the rite of circumcision. <laughs> when they got on the planes, and not even in seats, just loaded those planes full, they were frightened, but they believed that Isaiah 40, 31 was God's promise to them that they should mount up with wings as eagles. And they went home. But the interesting thing is, the black falashes of Ethiopia, when they settled in that land, said, we will never, never go back to Israel until it's time for Mashiach, Messiah, to return. And that's our Christ. They're back. He's coming. All right. Soon. Let's talk about Exodus uh, from Russia. Operation Exodus ship brings Russian Jews to Israel. Russian Jews inundate Israel. And again, Operation Exodus exceeds expectations. And then from the New York Times, last tribe of Jews return from Russia. And listen to this. This is from the Jerusalem Post. In 10 years, most Jews will be living in Israel. That surprised me, Jack. That's very significant, though, isn't it? <laughs> we already said that the Ethiopian Jews said we'll never return until it's the hour for Messiah to come, but this article from the New York Times saying that yes. the Jews from Russia were the last tribe really ties it together. Mm -hmm. Why? Jeremiah 317 and 18, beginning with verse 18, we'll back up. It says, They shall come together from the land of the north, draw a line from Israel to Russia and you've got a straight line north. From the north to the land which I've given them for inheritance, Israel, May 14th, 1948. But at that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord. Verse 17. What time? When they come as the last tribe from the north, Russia, 
then it's time for the throne of David to come back into existence and power. Who sits on the throne of David? Jesus. Luke 1, 32, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and He, Christ, shall sit upon the throne of His Father, David. And that's why Jerusalem at that time is called the city of the great King, Matthew 5, 35, for Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19, 16. Can't you see it all coming together? Our time here on earth is limited. And now that the Jews have gone home, the rest of Bible prophecy can quickly begin to unfold. And certainly one of the important aspects of what's coming in the future is the connection of the revived Roman Empire, or the EC, with Israel. Okay, let, let's see just a little bit of this right now. The European community, in a major turnabout, has decided to negotiate an enhanced role for Israel in the economically integrated Europe. They're already taking a role there. The EC is going to make room for Israel. Yes. Yes. Mm. Israel has agreed that the European Economic Community be represented alongside the United States and the former Soviet Union in any peace negotiations such as those begun in Madrid. The EEC has stated that since it will have to live with this Middle East peace treaty, it ought to have a part in its creation. So they do want to be involved and closely connected with the land of Israel, Jack. Rabbi Shively, as you interpreted the book of Daniel, you had it right. Here the EC wants to allow Israel to have a part politically in the movement. And Israel is calling upon the EC for assistance in the peace program. Remember what I said a few moments ago about Daniel chapter 2, the image with the ten toes, and Daniel chapter 7, the beast with the ten horns? You can find these expressions, ten toes and ten horns, twelve different times in this book. Check them out. Daniel 241, 242, and 244. And then about the ten horns, Daniel 7, 7, 720, 724. Six of them in the book of Daniel alone. <laughs> Shirley was right on. Then in the New Testament, Revelation 12, 3, Revelation 13, 1, Revelation 17, verses 3, 7, 12, and 16, 12 times. And this is the revived Roman Empire. This is the EC. I'm amazed. I've preached these things all my life. And it's all happening. The rabbi says we can know the history of our people, the Jews, through this book. I said it. There it is. It's all coming together from Daniel and the book of Revelation. You know, some people say, ah, that book of Revelation is symbolical. They build everything on that, but no, there are 20 some prophets, major and minor, plus the book of Revelation. For every one time his first coming is mentioned, his coming again is mentioned 20 times. This is not something insignificant or unimportant. And we're told that we are coming to the conclusion not of the world. We're going on for another thousand years as a planet. But the conclusion of the end of the age when Mashiach comes and we begin the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 4. Jake, you talk so often about a peace contract with Israel, with the Antichrist who will come out of the revived Roman Empire. Well, let's see what that peace contract involves, all right? First, uh, the pressure is on Israel to give land for peace right now. And, of course, we know the negotiations are going on, and there's great pressure there. Israel offers a land compromise in exchange for peace with Syria. And then from U.S. News & World Report, Israel and Syria take the first small steps toward peace. And again from the International Herald Tribune, partial Israeli pullout from Golan won't do. Syrian delegates say. Now, the Arabs say that Israel was illegal in her occupation of Jerusalem. The Arabs say this, and I quote, Israel's 1967 attack was aggression. Israel's current occupation is illegal. And this is from the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. And this is also what the Arabs have to say. 
it is concerning the PLO Charter, Article 15. The liberation of Palestine from an Arab viewpoint is a national duty to repulse the Zionist imperialist invasion from the great Arab homeland and to purge the Zionist presence from Palestine. Its full responsibilities fall upon the Arab nation, people, and the government, with the Palestinian Arabs at its head leading them. There's a lot of bitterness over all of these centuries between Ishmael of the Arabs and Isaac of the Israelites. It's going to keep on right until the final war. Palestine's seat must be Jerusalem, according to Arafat, who is, of course, the head of the PLO. And then once again, Saddam Hussein warned Egypt and the PLO not to di divert from recent Arab summit resolutions that call for a Palestinian state. Listen to this. With Jerusalem as its capital. So Jerusalem is in the hot seat once again, so to speak, Jack. Well, the Jewish people feel this way. Now we've seen what the Arabs right. feel. And that's the eternal battle between the son of Hagar, Ishmael, father of the Arabs, and Sarah, the mother of Isaac, who's the father of the Israelites. And this battle is going to go on right to the end. So we see the Arab viewpoint, it's our land, and now let's hear what the Jews have to say and why Jerusalem is so important. And let me add this right now. Do you know that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel 1,600 years before the birth of Muhammad? And do you know that they didn't even care about Jerusalem till 1187? A few thousand years later, when Muhammad proclaimed it the third in importance city of the Muslim faith. Mecca, Medina, one, two, and then Jerusalem. So it's not really that important to them, but it is important to the Jewish people, and here's why. Here's an article by Solomon Ostrovsky. Jerusalem still the key to Palestinian problem. Any arrangement concerning Jerusalem which leaves any part of the city in non-Jewish hands, even if it should be accepted by Jews who neither understand their history nor their destiny, will not stand. Now that's a position that the Jews in Israel are taking. Once again, uh, Mr. Sharon who was the defense minister at one time, said, we have one interest. We want to live here peacefully and defend our lives. We will pay no price to anyone. Jerusalem is not negotiable. And then again, here is the reason J Jerusalem is so meaningful to the Jews. From their writings, once again, Palestine is the center of the world. Jerusalem is the center of Palestine. The temple, the center of Jerusalem. The Holy of Holies, the center of the temple. The ark is the center of the Holy of Holies. And the front of the ark was a stone. And on that stone was engraved this, the foundation stone of the world. So you see, Jerusalem is very, very important. It's uh, non-negotiable, ladies and gentlemen, because when Messiah returns, and this is our Christ. You see, it's Mashiach in Hebrew, translated Christus in Greek, and Christ in English. When he returns, it's at Jerusalem. That's the city that our God has chosen. That's why Zechariah 14.4 says, His feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before, in front of Jerusalem on the east. And when Christ comes as King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19, 16, he sits in David's throne in Jerusalem. And as I said earlier, that's why Jerusalem, Jerusalem is called the city of the great king, Matthew 5, 35. The city of Mashiach, Jesus Christ. Jerusalem, even during the millennial hour, will be the eternal capital of the world. And that's why it says there, that's the foundation stone mm -hmm. for the world. They're right. I really like that's it. scripture. That's the word of God. You can't take any other position if you believe this book. Mm -hmm. 
I really like this, Jack. And in front of the ark was a stone called the foundation stone of the world. That's, That's <laughs> amazing right. to me. That's right. All right, the most important perspective, we've talked about the Arab perspective, the Israeli perspective, the most important perspective is God's right? So let's see what he has to say. The Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. It guaranteed that Palestine would eventually belong to Israel forever. Genesis 13, 14, 15, and Psalms 105, 9, and 11. The boundaries of the land were specified from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates and from the Great Sea or the Mediterranean to the desert beyond Jordan, Genesis 15, 18, Exodus 23, 31, Numbers 34, 1 through 12, Joshua 1, 4. And then this article goes on, the kingdoms of David and Solomon extended approximately to those boundaries that we just gave to you. Remember earlier in the video, we talked about the Abrahamic covenant wherein God promised land to Abraham? Genesis 15, 18 says, In the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates. Then, in the Palestinian covenant, he reaffirmed what he said to Abraham, and then again in the Davidic covenant enforced it one more time there is the map of what he promised to him now it has the old biblical names on it but let me tell you what part of the world that covers presently Egypt east of the Nile River Saudi Arabia Israel Jordan Syria Lebanon the southern part of Turkey and the western half of Iraq west of the Euphrates imagine <laughs> you see, if we're going to quibble about the land right now, Golan Heights in Jerusalem, it's meaningless. I don't know if there will even be another battle before the big one wherein Israel takes more of this land. But that's the land that God has promised to Abraham and through all these covenants, and it must happen. God cannot lie. Titus 1-2. So it's going to be interesting to see what's ahead of us soon. Jack, because of the fight over the land, anti-Semitism is growing around the world. The first quote that I would like to give to you is from the European newspaper. Riots drive home Nazi fear. Race hate mounts to fever pitch. Again, that's from the European newspaper. This is from Germany. Skinheads go on the war path again. Once again from Germany, Nazis using computer games to spread message of hate against the Jews. Again, recent polls show three of every five Germans sympathizing with the motives behind attacks on foreigners, and that's from U.S. News and World Report. And that's only one country, and as far as Gomer, Ezekiel 38, 6, 7, will go along with Russia when they make the move, so that's significant, but this is not just one nation. This is yeah. universal. Well, from the Detroit News, smoldering ashes of anti-Semitism burn in Hungary, so it, it is spreading all over uh, Europe and into the Middle East. Romania, Rabbi warns of anti-Semitism. In the wake of the recent manifestations of anti-Semitism in Poland, the younger members of the minuscule Jewish community there are giving serious consideration to immigration of Jews, and that was from the Jerusalem Post. But listen to this from Time magazine. It's going to break your heart. East Germany, Poland, Hungary, and Romania, among others, have their particular brands of vehement anti-Semitism smearing the walls, and I'm going to quote some of the things that they are painting uh, their graffiti. Jews to the ovens, Jews for soap, slogans on walls and shouting, we missed you, the Jews, the first time, but now we are coming back. Horrible, oh. horrible. And oh. because of this, world leaders are to discuss anti-Semitism in Europe, and this is from Brussels, Belgium. This is a yeah. serious problem. They're going to the EC headquarters, mm -hmm. and remember what we said earlier in the video, that the EC wants Israel to have a part politically in the movement. The Word of God is coming together. All right, and this is by Mr. Rosenthal, who visited the United Nations, and this is what he had to say. Every time I visit the United Nations, the, 
The same two sensations take hold, fascination and nausea. Whenever Israel is on the agenda or challenge put to the values and fantasies of the Arab Middle East, a poisonous stream of rage and falsehood pours from a shocking number of the nations assembled in the name of peace and truth. That shocked me, Jack. Hmm. And here's why, Rexella. These are the prophecies of the Bible for the last days. Let's listen to Jesus. He said in Matthew 24, 9, to his people, the Jews, not the Christians, as we'll prove in a moment, but his people, the Israelites, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, Matthew 24, 9. Now, how do I know he's speaking to the Jews? Because in verse 15, he warns about the abomination of desolation, the image of the Antichrist that is set up in the Jewish temple. In verse 16, he describes those who are fleeing as moving from Judea to the mountains and wilderness. And then, of course, in verse 20, they are not to flee on Shabbat, Sabbath day. The church worships on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Not the seventh day, Shabbat. And then over in Mark 13, 9, they're being persecuted in synagogues. Christians do not meet in synagogues. And in Luke 21, 20, the armies are converging against Jerusalem, not Detroit, Michigan, not San Francisco, Jerusalem. Therefore, when Jesus said that he would shorten the days for the elect, Matthew 24, 22. He's not talking about Christians. Many Christians say, that's why we'll be here during the tribulation hour, because we're the elect. No, God has two elect groups upon earth. Yahweh, Jehovah God, has his wife Israel, and the church of Jesus Christ is the bride of the Savior. Ephesians 1, 4, 1 Peter 1, 2. Now, you mean to tell me, Dr. Van Ippie, that Israel is called Jehovah's elect? Yes. Read the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 1, chapter 45, verse 4, chapter 65, verse 9, and 65, verse 22. Four times the father says concerning his wife, the Jews, mine elect, mine elect, mine elect, mine elect. Thus there has to be because Christ prophesied this great anti-Semitic purge. Then when you study Revelation 12, when Satan is cast out of heaven, verses 7 to 10, to the earth, and he knows he has but a short time left, and he knows how Yahweh God loves Israel, it's his last attempt to obliterate, liquidate, extinguish the Jew from the face of the earth. And that's why Revelation 12, 13 speaks about the dragon, and that's Satan, persecuting the woman who brought forth the man-child. Who is that woman? The Virgin Mary, a Jewess who brought forth the man-child Christ. How do I know that's what it means? Because in Romans 9, 4, it speaks about the Israelites, and verse 5 says, of whom, from the Israelites, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. So there's no doubt about it. There's going to be a great anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, hatred in the last hours before Jesus Christ comes, which will eventually lead to the greatest war in history preceding Armageddon, as we'll see in a few moments. Jack, in the midst of all this anti-Semitism, the Bible teaches that a world dictator, we call him the Antichrist, will arise, and he will make a peace contract with Israel and all the world, all the nations, and eventually set himself up as a god in a temple in Jerusalem. Okay, let's discuss now. I'm going to ask Jack if he'll discuss just a little bit about that peace contract. Will you do that, Jack, please? Right. We've talked about the EC earlier in the tape, and this world leader, this dictator called the Antichrist, rises to prominence in Revelation 13, 1. I saw a beast. He's called a beast because, remember what we said earlier? In Daniel 7, verses 4 to 8, there are four beasts. The fourth is a composite beast with ten horns. And so I saw this beast, referring back to that, rise up out of the sea of nations, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, this king of fierce continents, Daniel 8, 23, comes to 
power on a peace platform. He shall come peaceably, Daniel 11, 21. Uh, he shall enter in peaceably, Daniel 11, 24. But he really honors the God of forces, Daniel 11, 38. He's a military man. And war galore is going to follow, but he convinces the Jews and the other nations that he can make peace with them for seven years. And that's recorded in Daniel 9.27. He shall confirm, watch this, the covenant with many for one week. And that's the covenant of peace for one heptad. In the Hebrew Bible, it's heptad. We say decade for 10 years. The Jew says heptad for seven years. So it confirms the covenant of peace for seven years. Now we may have other peace contracts. But unless, number one, it's for seven years. Unless, number two, it is, watch this, the covenant. The covenant. Not a covenant, but the covenant. That's the mm. Abrahamic covenant. God showed it to me recently. Mm. For this land that stretches all the way across to Iraq. Not land for peace, negotiating for what's there now, but somehow the Jews are going to get a hold of more land because the covenant will come into effect for seven years. But in the midst of the seven years, he causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He is of course, going to sit in a temple in Jerusalem. The Jews are offering their sacrifices again, and he stops it all after 42 months. The tribulation period lasts seven years, and uh, that's 2,520 days. In Revelation 11, 3, Revelation 12, 6, we find that half of that's 1260 days, so 1260 days times two is 2,520 days. So, first, the Bible teaches that this Antichrist, when he comes to power on this peace platform, is controlled by Satan. And the dragon gives him his power, Revelation 20, verse 2, and the dragon is Satan. But then in the midst of the seven years, when Satan is cast out of the heavens, Revelation 12, verses 7 to 10, he then comes to earth, and because he knows his time is short, he incarnates this leader. And so for the first three and a half years, this Antichrist does not sit in a temple in Jerusalem, though it's erected. It doesn't even have to be erected until the middle, mm -hmm. but I believe it will be shortly before that. And then for the final 42 months, he sets himself up there as the world leader, and he calls himself God. He magnifies himself above every God, Daniel eleven thirty six and 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is worshipped or that is called God, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that peace contract is broken, as we'll see in a few moments from now, when Russia marches against Israel. They say, let's go against the land of unwalled villages against them that are at rest and dwell safely, Ezekiel 38, 11. Israel, since becoming a nation, May 14, 1948, has never been at peace, has never been at rest. They've had all the wars we mentioned earlier in the video. But when that peace contract is made for the land, the Abrahamic covenant, then Russia marches. A moment ago, I talked about a temple. I think you're going to find this very exciting. Oh, right. So, <laughs> I'm so excited about this because this is Arrhenius, the church father from 8185. This is 1800 years ago. And this is for you folks who say, oh, there'll be no millennium. That's mythological. That's symbolical. Wait a minute. The greatest church fathers of the first 300 years of Christendom taught there would be a millennium, taught there would be a thousand year reign of Christ. And Arrhenius was one of them. Oh, right. You've got to get every word of this. He said this in A.D. 185. When this Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three years and six months and sit in the temple at Jerusalem. And then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, sending this Antichrist and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in for the righteous the times of the kingdom. Uh, Jack, that is really something said in 185. That's exactly what this book says if one takes it literally. And by the way, you folks who think there'll be no millennium, who think we take it on one isolated text, Revelation 20, verse 4, ought to get my series on Revelation revealed, for I've got scores, at least 50 scriptural 
portions of the Bible to back documentary proof that there will be a millennium. And Arrhenius said it, and he had it right. Why? Because he believed this book. And the Bible teaches that this Antichrist will come, as we said, Revelation 13, 1, he will sit in that temple, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, for three and a half years, the last three and a half years of the seven-year period of tribulation. And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, begin reading of verse 3 through 10, Messiah, Jesus Christ, comes and destroys him, casts him into that lake of fire. Revelation 19, 20. And just as he said 1,800 years ago, as the Spirit of God guided him to look ahead, it's happening exactly, mm. exactly right now. Mm. Well, we've been talking about a tempo. The Jews are preparing for a temple, according to the Detroit News. And here is why. In the 613 Commandments, a rabbinic collection of the biblical precepts and prohibitions, approximately one-third relate or are dependent upon the presence of a temple in Jerusalem. Now, the Messianic Times says there is a move to rebuild the third temple, and it is growing. Rabbis expect to rebuild the temple, according to the Miami Herald. And then Dr. Asher Kaufman says this, I believe that the time for the erection of the third temple could be close at hand. Well, the man who's going to do that, build the temple, is a 53-year-old man in Jerusalem right now, and his name is Gershon Solomon. And uh, this is what they say about him. They're building the temple as a project which, which dominates Solomon's life. He believes it is the reason God has chosen him to live. And again, to build a temple, you've got to have a mount. Israel may soon take temple mount. Uh, once again, at the historic Middle East Peace Conference held in the fall of 1991 in Madrid, Spain, special mention was made of a temple mount in Jerusalem. You're going to interrupt Let's me right there, right aren't you, there. <laughs> Special mention was made of the mount at the Madrid conference when the EC and the other nations met with the Israelis and the Arabs to discuss the future. This isn't just happenstance. I've said it many times on this video. We are living in the last days, friends. Now, this Antichrist will sit in that temple, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Why do we believe we're right at the end? Because this Antichrist makes an image of himself for people to worship and situates it in the temple. Now, there has to be a temple to do that. And here the Jews, for the first time since 70, 80, are talking about the temple and the mountain, the cornerstone and all the rest. So listen very carefully. When this Antichrist comes to power, Revelation 13, verse 15 says, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Who is the beast? Revelation 13, 1, this Antichrist. And we get that term beast from that composite beast in Daniel, remember, Rabbi Shively, 1935, from the composite beast with ten horns in Daniel 7, verses 4 to 8. All right? He makes an image of himself. The world is told they must bow to it. Now, Daniel speaks about such an image in chapter 12, verse 11, and calls it the abomination that maketh desolate. In chapter 11, he also mentioned an original one when Antiochus Epiphanes, and that means the exalted one, set up an image of his Greek god, Zeus, in the Jewish temple. He'd just been to Egypt, conquered it, but things weren't going as he desired, and he left Egypt, and on his way back to Greece, slaughtered thousands of Jews and set up this image. And it was called, let me repeat it, the abomination, that's what it was, that makes the temple desolate. The abomination that make it desolate. All right? The crowds of the day called him Antiochus Epimenes, the madman. And he was. 
He even made the Jewish people the 25th of every month, because he was born on the 25th, come and bow to this image and even desecrated the temple with sows. And as you know, Jewish theology is against even the eating of pork. Well, he is the forerunner, the picture of the final Antichrist who will come, who will set up his image. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, and again in Mark chapter 13, when you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Christ is quoting this Old Testament prophet Daniel. Standing where it ought not, the Jewish temple, then let them which be in Judea flee, because the horrendous last three and a half years of the tribulation is about to fall upon them. But remember, none of this can happen as predicted in the Bible, till there is a temple. Now, there'll be two temples, Rexella. I believe the one that Antichrist desecrates could be the third temple, and then that there would be a fourth temple. Uh, it's mentioned in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48 that Messiah himself supervises mm. upon his return. Well, every temple, Jack, needs to have equipment and uh, vessels in it. And at present, 53 of the 103 vessels the Bible says were used in the ancient temple have been or are in the process of being constructed. Now, I think that's exciting, oh. don't you, Jack? They're over halfway. <laughs> Among those are the golden crown of the high priest, the priestly garments, a copper wash basin, for the purification of the priests for temple service, implements for sacrificial service, and the high priest's lottery box, and a set of incense utensils and incense spices, and the silver trumpets for calling tr uh, worshipers to the temple. The 12 gemstones to be set in the breastplate of the high priest are currently being researched and prepared by a local craftsman. They were almost there. Let me stop because one of the things you mentioned uh, was implements for sacrificial service. They're going back to offering sacrifices. Hmm. Now we know we're headed toward that time because when this Antichrist makes this peace contract with Israel and the nations, Daniel 9, 27, in the middle of it, he causes the sacrifices to cease. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of Christians oppose that because they say when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it was once for all and forever, the theme of the book of Hebrews. But that presents no problem because they are also offering sacrifices in the final millennial temple when Messiah himself is here in Ezekiel 40 to 48. But why? Well, we Christians look to Christ yes. for salvation, mm -hmm. and his work at Calvary was the finished product. But we still, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, take the communion supper in remembrance of his body and shed blood. Yes. The Jews at that point in time will not offer animal sacrifices to take away their sins, for animal sacrifices could never do that, Hebrews 10, 4, but they also will do it to remember. So there are two economies here, the Christian taking his bread and juice and the Jew offering his sacrifice in remembrance of what the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, John 1, did when he died for all of us. Hmm. So that's interesting. Something else that they needed, Jack, was a red heifer. Ashes from red heifer to be produced in Israel in anticipation of the third temple. And you can find that in Numbers chapter 19. And you see, they had to have the ashes of the red heifer for perpetuity's sake. So thus, every time they kill the red heifer and they burn the ashes in sacrifice, they had to take some of the previous ashes and mix it with the ashes of the new red heifer. So now they believe they know where the ashes are and they're going to create or find a red heifer soon. I think you've got that there. Yes, I do. Yes, right what here. did it say? The Temple Institute believes that they have found a means of producing an authentic red heifer even today. Mm -hmm. So with the ashes of the previous heifers that they have claimed of located, mixing it with this red heifer, they now have that which is necessary 
for temple service. Jack, they need priests if they're going to have temples, and Rabbi Kahain says that they are ready. His list contains thousands of names along with the addresses and professions of those on the list. This way, he said, when the Messiah comes, I can say, here, Mr. Messiah, here's your data base. Amazing. Yeah, the names of thousands of qualified priests, and they have to come from the Levitical line, so they've done a lot of research, and most of them have to be Cohen's, because that is the priestly tribe. All right, Jack, now, the big question. Will this peace contract hold? Now, we have a peace contract with an Antichrist sitting in a temple in Jerusalem. Is it going to hold? If you will draw a straight line from Jerusalem to the North Pole on your map, you will find that this line will pass right near the city of Moscow. Both Moscow and Jerusalem are located near the same meridian. So it's almost directly north right. of Jerusalem. And I mentioned a few moments ago from Ezekiel 38, 11, that when Israel was at peace, the one who would break the contract is Russia. So this is interesting. And oh, I love this. Madrish Tehillim, the book from which I'm going to quote right now, Jack, it says this, that Gog and Magog will come against Israel in the future three times, and the third time they will come up against Jerusalem. And, of course, they quoted Zechariah 12, 2, which states this, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of staggering unto all the peoples round about. What is a cup of staggering? It means that he will, in the future, make the people drink the cup of staggering, which is a cup of blood. When Magog and Gog go up against them, in Jerusalem. Magog and Gog go up against them and three of the greatest intellectual rabbis ever made that statement. And it's just like when we were there, President mm -hmm. Navan said, we will have a war with Russia because mm -hmm. Ezekiel 38 and 39 predicted. You see, if you draw that line straight from Jerusalem, it goes to Russia. You got it? It doesn't matter if the other republics are not with him. Some will join with him. It was Russia. It's always been Russia. They come against Israel from the north, Ezekiel 38, 15, Ezekiel 39, 2. You find that in Jeremiah 1, 13, Jeremiah 6, 22, 10, 22. You find it in Daniel 11, 40, 44, and in Joel 2, 20, when they're driven back from the Holy Land to Siberia. Now, who are they? Ezekiel 38, 1, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. Remember what the three rabbis just said? The chief, and in your Hebrew Bible, that would be the Rosh, prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, Rosh is easily identified as Russia today, the Russian prince of Meshach and Tubal. Who's Meshach? Meshach is the original name for what is today Moscow. It was Meshach, later changed to Mosach, then Muscati, Muscovy, and Moscow. Tubal is southwest of Siberia on a world map presently. And they are going to come against Israel. It's mentioned 19 times in chapters 38 and 39 of Ezekiel. Against the mountains of Israel, 38.8. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel, verse 16. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, verse 19. Uh, chapter 39, verse 12, seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing them. We could go on and on. Please order my video if you really want to study this subject thoroughly as entitled Russia, World War III, and Armageddon. All right, Jack, the great struggle between the Muslims and the uh, Jewish people, has, it's been there a long, long time. The Muslim Brotherhood was founded in Ismailia, Egypt in 1928 by Hassan al-Bani, who coined a simple yet compelling slogan. Listen to this, I think it will make you think. Allah is our goal, the Prophet is our leader, the Quran is our constitution, holy war is our way, death for Allah's sake is our supreme desire. They want to die for him. Mm -hmm. But we've got to remember one thing, there are one billion Muslims in the world and 800 million of them in other nations such as Indonesia are not for this holy jihad against Israel. The battle is between 200 million of these Muslims, Arabs, not the other 800 million. But the Arabs, because of the ancient fight between 
Isaac and Ishmael, which is still continuing, want to create this in the future. The obliteration of the land of Israel. And of course, you know, when we talk about that war with Russia, we're going to see how the Arab nations, the Arab Muslims, align themselves with Rosh for that battle in the future. The president of Iran, Rafsanjani, said it's time to pull out this cankerous tumor, he meant Israel, from the body of the Muslim world. Every problem in our religion can be traced to this single dilemma, the everlasting struggle between Ishmael and Isaac. There it is. Yeah, cannot cease until one of the other is utterly vanquished. Uh, that is their goal, obliteration. This is interesting, Rick Sally. In Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, where Russia marches against Israel, Persia joins with Russia. Who is Persia? Remember the little vision that Nebuchadnezzar had at the beginning of the video, where he saw the chest and arms of silver representing the Medes and the Persians? Well, that's Persia. And today, they still call it the Persian Gulf, and the two nations that basically formed Persia down through history, though they've changed their name since, happen to be Iran and Iraq. It's falling into place. Talk about Iraq. They hired 50 Soviet nuclear scientists. Wonder why. And let's go a little farther with Iraq, because whether it's Saddam Hussein or not, who rules in the future, the Bible teaches they'll go with Rosh. In fact, Russia and the Orient will use Iraq because they come across that area to the Euphrates River, as is found in Revelation 9, verses 14 to 16. In fact, Schwarzkopf and our armies, the armies allied with us, stopped at the Euphrates River, but it will begin there again because the Word of God says, Yahweh the Almighty speaking, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates to slay a third part of mankind. We're now putting the last pieces of the puzzle into place. Israel must disappear, says Libyan dictator Mamar Gaddafi. That's quite a statement also, Jack. Ezekiel 38, 5, imagine Libya. Don't have to prove anything. Just open your Bible and look at it. All right, now let's talk about China. Iran to get a power reactor from China. So they're entering in. There's your Pacific Rim. Right. In Revelation 16, 12, we are told that the armies from the Orient move across that part of the world called Iraq. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates so that the way of the kings of the east, literal translation, the kings of the sun rising, might be prepared. So as we see Iran, Iraq, becoming bosom buddies with China, Japan in the future, and uh, that oriental grouping, they'll move across there on the march to Israel. They'll come from the south first as Egypt leads a federation or at least aligns them to go with Russia. Uh, then they'll come from the north, Daniel 1140, uh, and then from the east, Daniel 1144, as all the nations from the four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west, converge for the greatest war in history just preceding Armageddon. Turkey's going to play an important role also. Turkey to cut flow of Euphrates. Once the project of 15 dams and 18 hydroelectric power plants is completed, Turkey will have a stranglehold on the waters of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. So she's very important <laughs> also. I just quoted the verse, but let me repeat it. It's so powerful. Revelation 16, 12. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates so that the kings of the east might march across it on dry ground. That's amazing. This could not happen until now, but now with her 15 dams, they just need to pull the levers and they can dry up portions. And it says the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Yes. Exactly. And of course, Tagarma at that time will shift its allegiance to Russia because she is the Tagarma of Ezekiel 38.6. Now friends, the last event to take place just prior to the return of the Lord is this terrible, terrible war that we've been talking about that will take place in Israel. Perhaps this is why the Jews are all looking for a Redeemer, and they call him their Messiah from Time Magazine. Jews are setting dates for Messiah. 
Rabbi Sneerson says the miracles in Israel and the conclusion of the war are testimony that the Messiah will soon arrive. And then once again from the Seattle Times, House of the Messiah is ready in Israel. It's even a brownstone, sort of after the fashion in Boston, I guess. This is so beautiful. For when Messiah comes, it is not the end of the world. We are not doomsday prophets. We believe there is going to be a tribulation hour, and it's going to be a bloody time, especially the last 42 months or three and a half years of this period. But at the end, Jesus Christ comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19:16. There is the Battle of Armageddon, and the armies of the world come against Jesus Christ at that point. Psalm 2, verses 1 to 5. Revelation 19, 19 says, I saw the beast. Remember him? That composite beast in Daniel 7? That beast that rose up out of the Sea of Nations in Revelation 13, 1, having seven heads and ten horns? Now he says, this is the finality of it all, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, Jesus Christ that sat on the white horse of verse 11 of Revelation 19. When you stop to think the EC is forming, they're even talking about their own army and defense system, and that they're going to lead the remnants of the armies left over from the horrendous battle in the Middle East after Russia's invasion. You know that it's near. But then Messiah sets a peace. You see, they tried peace under the false Christ, the Antichrist, and be careful that you're not looking for the wrong one. Jesus mentioned that in Matthew 24, verses 3 and 24, as you read the entire chapter. But this true Messiah, when he comes, is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. The other one's going to claim peace, but he'll be one who honors the God of forces, Daniel eleven thirty. but not in Jesus. And when this Prince of Peace comes, then they beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hooks, Isaiah 2, 4. Then the spiritual is going to be true. Ain't going to study war no more. Not good grammar, but wonderful theology with Jesus here. It's going to be a place of beauty. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose, Isaiah 35, 1. It's going to be a place of health. For Isaiah the prophet said in chapter 35, verses 4 and onward, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be a stop. Then shall the lame man leap, as in heart a deer, and the tongues of the tongue-tied shall sing. And that's because Revelation, the 22nd chapter, says that there's a tree of life, and it bears 12 manner of fruits, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing and that's literally in the Greek, the health of the nations. No more sickness, no more disease, no more death, Revelation 21, 4. Time of tranquility, joy. Oh, I'm looking forward to that time. It's all so near. But before even that event occurs, Jesus breaks through the blue to call his church home, as found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the dead, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are you ready for the shout of Revelation 4.1? Come up hither. And we go up in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15.51-54 and we're changed to be like Jesus. Philippians 3.21, 1 John 3.2, when we see Jesus, we shall be like him. And then we return with him, for the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, Jude 14. The armies in heaven followed him, Revelation 19.14. As he comes, as the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Are you ready? It's all here. I plead with you to get saved. I plead with you to get right with God. How? Before God can save you, you must believe you're a sinner. All have sinned. Romans 3.23.
Galatians 3.22, the scripture hath concluded all under sin. I don't have to prove that to anyone, do I? Now, if one repents of his sin, he can be cleansed, and his sins can be forgiven and forgotten. If he remains in his sin, sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death, James 1.15. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. First of all, that's physical death, for it's appointed unto men once to die, Hebrews 9.27, but it's also the second death, which is the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. The good news is Christ died for you. Christ died for our sin, 1 Corinthians 15.3. Every single sin you've ever committed, you don't have to carry one of them. You can be forgiven today if you do one thing. As many as received Jesus, to them gave Yahweh power to become sons of God. The Father will make you one of his sons when you come to the cross, see the shed blood, saying it was for me, and then receiving Christ. And he'll not only forgive everything you've ever done, but he'll forget it. <sighs> Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more Hebrews 8.12 why don't you do it you who are lost you are away from God pray right now come home Father look at me and pray I'm a sinner I deserve judgment but you died for me from my sin shedding your blood to cleanse me, to wash me, to save me. I receive what you did for me. I receive you as my Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Save me now in your name. Amen. Amen. I pray that many of you viewing this video just committed your life to the Lord and opened your life to Him. And if you did, would you please write to me? I'd love to send this little booklet to you absolutely free. First Steps in a New Direction. I guarantee that if you know the Lord Jesus in this hour of uncertainty, you'll not have fear. I love what the psalmist said in Psalm 56, 3. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. The best antidote for fear is faith. Remember John 14, 1 through 6. When Jesus concluded that portion of Scripture, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life.